My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. If you've never been in this position, well, aren't you lucky? But don't worry, you will be someday. You're at the airport early. It's a beautiful day. Your flight is in a couple of hours. You got there on time. You got right through security. Your luggage that you checked didn't weigh too much. And your carry-on fit perfectly in that little carry-on thing. You grabbed a coffee and a book and sat down at the gate to wait. You did everything right. And then your flight gets delayed by a few hours. Or... An announcement comes on that tells you, sorry, actually, it's overbooked. Any takers for the next flight? Or even, ugh, crew issue. Sorry, this flight is cancelled. And you sit there, seething, because you know you got screwed. The weather's perfect, you were early, you had all your documents, you can see the plane right there on the tarmac. But nope. Sorry for the inconvenience. This is ridiculous, you think to yourself. Don't I have any rights? I should sue this airline. Well, yes, you do. And yes, you can. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Gabor Lukacs is the president of Air Passenger Rights. Hello, Gabor. Hi, Jordan. Can you maybe begin just by telling us about uh, the Halifax couple who decided to sue WestJet? What happened? I was not directly involved in that case. So what I know is just by what I'm reading from the court's decision. But it seems that the passengers booked in October 2022 a round trip Halifax, Toronto, Halifax trip with uh, WestJet. They were supposed to be leaving to Toronto on December 23rd and be back on January 2nd. But on December 23rd, the flight was canceled due to uh, weather conditions in Toronto. That was a legitimate cancellation and nobody has any complaints about that. WestJet then gave the couple a new flight, a new itinerary, departing two days later on December 25th. And it was that second flight, two days later, that was delayed by more than three hours, which is the threshold for entitlement to compensation under their passenger protection regulations. When the passengers complained to WestJet and sought compensation for that replacement, second replacement flight delay and and the ensuing delay as a result, they were turned away. WestJet was arguing essentially that somehow that delay on two days later was logically connected to the initial delay, to the weather delay, and therefore the passenger should not be paid any compensation. As a matter of fact, that second delay was due to crew availability issues and had nothing to do with weather. The court ultimately found that these were two separate flights, two separate incidents, and uh, the fact that the initial itinerary of the passengers on the 23rd, the initial flight was canceled due to weather, has nothing to do with the second incident, which was a delay of the replacement flight. The court noted, this analysis is not complicated and appears to be entirely consistent with the applicable legislative provisions that should end the story. So what was the result? At the end, the court ordered WestJet to comply with the APPR and to pay the passengers $400 lump sum compensation each, plus $99.70 in filing fees. You mentioned you weren't involved in this case specifically. Is this case unique? How common is it for people to take an airline to court? And uh, how often do they actually win? We do 
encourage passengers to avoid taking airlines to the Canadian Transportation Agency, the federal regulator, because of concerns of impartiality, close relationship with airlines, and a huge backlog of well over 50,000 cases. So in practical terms, small claims court is the only option for passengers who are not paid compensation owed to them under the law. Recently, I checked and in uh, Manitoba, which is a small province, I, I saw over 40 cases against Air Canada in a court docket since 2020. Airlines systematically don't pay p- compensation owed to passengers. Those few cases that get reported are just the tip of the iceberg. Often what happens is that on the evening before a trial, the airline will try to settle with a passenger and offer them some money to go away. Often the airline's offer is contingent on the passengers agreeing to a gag order, a non-disclosure type of condition, uh, which is quite troublesome because we are dealing with compensation, which is all under a statute, under a, a legislation, not just a contractual obligation. So in many cases, we don't end up hearing about these lawsuits because they get settled just on the stairs, on the steps of the courthouse. Let me ask you, as somebody who uh, is obviously incredibly passionate in terms of advocating for this, how many Canadians do you think understand that as passengers they have rights? And, and how well do you think they understand what kind of rights they have when this kind of stuff happens? Unfortunately, there is a very limited understanding of passenger rights, even among those people who are supposed to be dealing with passenger rights and enforce them. And they don't always understand passenger rights to begin with. From a judicial perspective, uh, it is a topic that small claims court adjudicators are learning now. For example, in British Columbia, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, they are developing a quite good, helpful, balanced case law on issues of passenger rights. And as Mr. I'm not expecting an adjudicator to favor one side or the other. And what I like about a BC jurisprudence is that in most cases, it's just fair. Not making any kind of concessions to either party, not bending the rules, not bending corners, not cutting corners, just applying the law as written. And that's a very nice thing to see overall. In terms of understanding, um, there is now perhaps some understanding that there are some rights, that you should be asking the question, what my rights are? which is a great progress compared to, say, 15 years ago, where people just assume that you have none. But there's still a lot of misunderstanding among airline employees who are frontline people interacting with passengers. And many passengers don't quite understand what their rights are, not to mention that the current incarnation of the air passenger protection regulations are so incredibly complex that it is very difficult to find your way in it. So if you have a difficulty understanding what your rights are, The problem is not with you. The problem is with the government enacting regulations that we advise the government in advance that would be counterproductive, too complicated, not really helping passengers. What do cases going to small claims court mean for the future of passenger rights in this country? And I I ask that in terms of what does it mean for possible reforms or uh, for the airlines complying with them? And will we see more of this? Small claims court cases may be helpful to highlight problems in what the airlines are doing and highlight potential loopholes. For example, the BC Civil Resolution Tribunal made a number of good legally correct rulings on situations which he predicted that would happen, that a passenger showing up at the airport on time with all necessary paperwork, but due to perhaps crew shortage or some other error by the airline, they are not even issued a boarding pass. They are de- denied transportation, but the flight is not overbooked. In Europe, in such situations, the passenger would be still treated as a case of denied boarding because they were at the airport on time and there was no reason not to transport them. But under the APPR, such cases are not considered to be denied boarding and there's no automatic compensation, which is, of course, a loophole. It's absurd. Why should you not be getting compensation when you did everything by the book and the airline is making a mistake? The BC Civil Resolutions Tribunal highlighted this issue in some of his decisions. They applied the law as written in a fair and correct manner, but at the same time, they have helped a lot to flag that there is a problem, that the law 
as written, does not operate the way we meant we intended it to operate. That's one function of small claims court cases. The other function is, of course, to force airlines to comply with the law. But it is uh, still not a particularly efficient way in the sense that the worst outcome for an airline in small claims court is to have to pay what they anyway owe to the passenger and plus some filing fees or nominal cost. There are no significant behavior modifying uh, consequences for airlines that break the law. And that's the other problem. So small claims court helps to document uh, what the airlines have been doing, but they don't have the behavior modification factor or effect that we would need. And that's really the root of the problem in Canada. You mean they can't uh, establish punitive measures that make it worth the airline's time to fix this? That's right. The small claims court, the goal not to punish any party, the goal is simply to adjudicate a dispute, like a contractual dispute. You have a dispute over your car, whether it was sold or wasn't sold, or whether it was defective or not. You just make sure that the people are being put where they should be and any cost incurred to get a partial indemnity. Uh, this, this model of dispute resolution is quite workable if you're dealing with, uh, with non-recurrent type of problems. But with airlines, any kind of consumer transaction where you have a large numbers, not complying with the law is not a kind of one-off dispute, but is a systemic aspect, systemic issue, where currently it's actually far more profitable for an airline to resist paying compensation in many cases and occasionally be fined or be ordered to pay compensation by a court and to actually consistently comply with the law. My name is Jordan Heath-Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. You mentioned uh, earlier that a certain situation wouldn't have unfolded that way in Europe. How does Canada compare to passenger rights either on uh, continents or other countries around the world? Canada is behind not only the European Union's gold standard, but also behind rules for passenger compensation in Israel and even in Turkey. The way the rules are written in Canada are not conducive to meaningful enforcement. They, are, they don't lend themselves to easy enforcement. They are disproportionately complex and complicated, often requiring a disproportionate amount of evidence to deal just with a $400 claim. That also shows as challenging enforcement, how much evidence an enforcement officer needs to amass to actually be able to issue a monitoring penalty, which are also available. The government can fine airlines up to $25,000 per violation per incident, but there's absolutely no appetite for it at the government level to use those powers. So far, last time I checked, there was only one fine issued since 2019 for an airline that failed to pay passenger compensation owed to them under, under the APPR. Many of the other penalties that were issued were issued for some low-hanging fruit, like an appropriate notice or not responding to complaints on time, but not actually to the real capital offense in this context, which is not paying the compensation. The uh, government uh, is not actually fixing the regulations with respect to the power to issue higher fines that were conferred just recently in the Budget Implementation Act this past summer. The legislation increased the maximum amount of fine that can be imposed through administrative means on an airline for breaking the air passenger protection regulations from $25,000 to $250,000. But that, that cap has not been uh, implemented in regulations. So the power was given to the Canadian Transportation Agency, the federal regulator, but they're actually not taking the least minimum step to actually be able to use that power to issue higher fines. This is not meant to be a rhetorical question, I swear. But why put that in the legislation and not use it? And that's the question that I would love to see you ask the Minister of Transport and the Prime Minister and Cabinet members. Because remember, although the government loves to tell the public, oh, the Canadian Transportation Agency is independent and we'll let them do their job, under the law, Cabinet, it is referenced as governor and council, 
can actually on its own amend the regulations. They don't need to get another approval from the Canadian Transportation Agency. Under Section 40 of the Canada Transportation Act, anytime, overnight, the cabinet can amend the regulations. So if the legislation already was put in place to increase the amount of fines, the government at the very least could amend the regulations to match what the legislation says. It doesn't require any kind of special expertise. Parliament already spoke, so just make sure the regulations reflect what Parliament said. It's not happening, and I would love to see an accountability interview with the Minister of Transport and ask him, why has it not happened? Just to play devil's advocate here for a minute, how much of that reluctance to be so punitive against the airlines could have to do with, to be frank, how badly some Canadian airlines are struggling and how much we need them as a core of our transportation? It's a loaded question. Finding any corporation for disobeying the law is not punitive per se. It is corrective. It is behavior modification. If we have laws that require a corporation, or an airline in this case, to pay a certain amount in a certain circumstance, then those regulations and laws have to be enforced. If we find as a society that it may impose too big of a financial burden on the particular industry, the laws need to be changed. Not enforcing laws as written is not the answer under any circumstance. I also don't accept the premise that corporations are doing particularly poorly. You may have just uh, listen to the uh, recent statements by Air Canada to the effect that the proposed changes to the APPR, which the government has been talking about for a long time now, uh, would not really affect its bottom line or it would not significantly affect profits. So while the airlines, of course, like to complain about how poor they are, even during the pandemic, Air Canada's finances were great. The ultimate answer, however, is this. If an airline cannot provide reliable service that meets some common service standards, they should not be operating. The same way that we don't permit supermarkets to sell spoiled meat just because we think it's cheap, we shouldn't be permitting airlines to operate a service that doesn't meet some well-agreed parameters of service. And let's remember, we're talking here about compensation to passengers that, that would be payable in circumstances that the airline could very significantly mitigate. There is no legal obligation for an airline to sell tickets on flights that maybe will not fail. It's a gamble the airline makes. They hope that the flight is going to have enough passengers, enough, enough demand. Well, once they put that promise out there to operate the flight, once they sold the tickets, they have to also face the consequence downside that maybe only the plane is half full. Airlines love to extort, I guess, the government by threats of cutting regional routes. And unfortunately, the government may, may not be doing enough to explain to the public that having regional flights, as convenient as it is, is not a God-given right of Canadians. It's an economic question whether it's profitable or not. If some, econ- some regional routes are deemed to be important, perhaps they should be subsidized openly in an accountable manner where one actually accounts for the financial benefit, which may be substantial of subsidizing the given flight versus the cost from the taxpayer's money. One thing I'm clear is that, in my mind, any kind of economic system, any kind of regime that, that is based on having laws but treating the laws as mere accommodations is going to be a hotbed for corruption. Uh, and that's not something I would love to see. Either change the laws or enforce them. I don't see a third option. Because you mentioned... um delayed or canceled or uh, non-filled flights. What have we seen in terms of, if any, improvements in those categories from, I mean, we covered it on this podcast, you know, post-pandemic, when airports started opening up again. It was kind of a mess, right? Is it getting better out there? It's uh, hard to say. Uh, What I'm seeing is that at least now there are no such big scandals. I'm curious what is going to happen now over the holiday season. It's yet to be seen. Certainly, it was not just one problem that happened. We remember that actually when things were opening up in uh, 2021, there was still very slow slow traffic, little traffic. That was not the worst part. It is in 2022 when airlines have been selling tickets and, and 
advertising flights way beyond and above the capacity that airports have to handle traffic. And to my knowledge and to what I, based on what I've heard in testimonies before the House of Commons Transport Committee, airports did relay the information to airlines about how much traffic they can handle. And airlines were selling tickets and offering flights as if there was no tomorrow. So that happened this past summer, in summer 2022. And then came December 2022, the holiday season, and we saw another meltdown of the transportation system. Certainly the changes that we are seeing now are somewhat responding to that, both in terms of public outcry and perhaps uh, justification for some changes that, that, that would have been in the pipelines. What I'm finding interesting is that many of the changes the government have agreed to do grudgingly now were things that we flagged already as early as 2017 and they predicted that they would cause problems in 2019. The government is still not committed to to fixing them, uh, which is a problem. But ultimately, uh, what the airlines understand now is that having too many problems today may mean much tougher regulations tomorrow. Let me close with a practical question for anybody who's gone through this. And I mentioned uh, in the intro the feeling of sitting in an airport, having done everything right, gotten to the gate on time, uh, gotten everything checked, and all of a sudden being bumped from your flight or being told your flight is not happening and you're leaving six hours later. What should someone in that situation do to ensure they get the compensation that they're entitled to? The most important step is document what is happening around you. Take photos of the screens with information. Record the audio of the announcements being made. Record your conversation with the airline's agents and the information they give out. It may not be conclusive, but it may provide you some indication and good evidence of uh, when it has to go to trial. The airline may try to argue that trial it was a weather and you can have their stand audio of the agents saying, oh, one of our pilots didn't get up in the morning or was sick or um, the airplane was hit by one of our trucks. Those kind of bits of information are valuable because it helps you at the trial to ask questions and at least not to look like you're on a fishing expedition. What do you do once you have that evidence? Do you approach the airline and say, hey, you know, you told me this was weather. It's clearly not. I need money. How do you find out how much you're entitled to? And and I guess my main question is like, what do you do? So you, you've gathered the stuff. What do you do next before you then consider like this isn't working? Maybe I should take them to small claims court. So as a first step, you make a claim to the airline. Most airlines have some forms online, but if you cannot find it or it doesn't work, and you send an e- airline or airline's lawyers an email outlining very briefly just the bare facts. This is what happened, and this is what I'm seeking. And I wouldn't go into long details about how offended you felt. Your feelings don't matter here. It's a statutory compensation. This is what happened. This is how much I was delayed. This is my, my understanding of the reasons for this delay or cancellation. Please pay up. And if they don't respond within 30 days or if they are being invasive, you may want to give them another chance, ask them for details about the cause. If it was a flight, say, uh, the aircraft broke down, what was the number of the aircraft, uh, when it wasn't discovered, how it was discovered, when it was repaired, what time the aircraft came back to service, what other aircraft were available at the time. Basic questions, but ultimately, if there is no answer and most airlines just refuse to answer these questions, use the airline's refusal to address those questions as evidence in court and you just file a small claims court paper as a next step. Gabor, thank you so much for walking us through this and uh, for your advocacy for all the people that are sitting in airports pissed off right now. Thank you very much for having me. Gabor Lukac, president of Air Passenger Rights. That was The Big Story. For more, as you well know by now, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca and listen to one of hundreds of episodes we've released I'm sure you can find something that interests you. Just type it in the search bar. See if we've done one. I do that sometimes, and I realize actually we've done two episodes on the exact same topic. Whoops. You don't have any rights to sue us in that situation. If you want to talk to us, though, and complain when you do catch us doing two episodes on the exact same topic, you can do it by finding us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can do it by writing to us. The email address is hello at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And you can do it 
by phone in a voicemail. That number is 416-935-5935. If you want to send me something right now, I will take your favorite cold remedies. You can find this podcast in every podcast player you like, and you can get it on your smart speaker by asking it to play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. It's 1986, Newark, and Michael Morrison is offered the opportunity of a lifetime. A new job, a fresh start with a secure future as a cop. But Mike has no idea he's about to join what he calls the biggest gang in America. I'm Saren Jones, and this is Black and Blue Behind the Badge, a story about what happens when you have to pick a side. Follow Black and Blue Behind the Badge on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.